So please help me welcome Mr. John Walters. Good afternoon. How are you doing? Good, good, good. Oh, it's great to be on campus. It's, uh, and, you know, Eric ordered up some fall weather. So it was about a million degrees in Austin when I left, and it's very nice to actually be able to wear a long sleeve shirt and a pair of shorts and feel really comfortable. And uh, it was great to be back for the game, except for the last four seconds. Uh, it was a wonderful night. Um, so, uh, Eric asked me to come talk about um, who I am, where, how did I get from point A to point B, uh, how did I wind up in Austin, Texas doing software, you know, a kid from you know, small town Mississippi. How many people have, are from a hometown with less than four red lights? See, that's how we measured it. I only had three red lights growing up in Fulton. It's up to five now, I think. But they replaced one of them with a four-way stop, so I don't know if that's progress or not. So, um, so how do you get from, from here to there? So we're going to spend some time today talking about um, the, the companies I've been involved with, uh, uh, the path that I took, you know, and, you know, what I do now, and hopefully provide some insights for you as you guys are interested in, in starting or running or you're going to be involved in something after you graduate from here. Um, you know, your parents didn't send you here. Well, they sent you here to, you know, have fun and grow up a little bit, but they do want you to get a job somewhere. You know, and get off the payroll, as, as, as parents will say. We want you to get off the payroll sometime in life. Uh, so, kind of kicking it off, who am I? I'm from Fulton, Mississippi, right up there, uh, east of the Big B, uh, a little bitty town. Anybody from that part of the country? All right. Three, four, yes. All right, good deal. Uh, grew up, went to Edelman Agricultural High School. Graduated, came down to Mississippi State. So, came to Mississippi State and, yep. Um, came to Mississippi State, uh, was an aerospace engineering major starting out. Uh, two years of that, co op at Lockheed uh, in Marietta, Georgia. Decided I didn't want to be an aerospace engineer. Went over to business school, got my undergraduate in marketing. Uh, liked it so much that even though I had a job offer in hand from Procter & Gamble, uh, I had to make that phone call to my parents and say, you know what, I, yes, I do have a job, uh, and it pays good money, uh, but I'm going to turn that job down, and I'm going to go on to grad school. And so I stayed and got my uh, MBA, and at that point you did minors and uh, majors in your, in your master program, so uh, finance and economics, um, and had just a, a wonderful time here at Mississippi State the best time of your life. Enjoy every moment of it. Go to every lecture, poetry reading, football game, soccer game, volleyball game. Do it all. You know, just have fun with it. Because you never know where those interactions and those connections that you're going to make are going to come in handy later in life. So, after graduate school, went to work with Anderson Consulting, which is also known by its current name. Anyone? Anyone? Accenture uh, is uh, it's a global uh, consulting firm. I think they're up to like 180,000 employees uh, globally. Went to work with Anderson Consulting in New Orleans, um, and they took this freshly minted MBA with marketing and finance and economics. And what did they do to me? They turned me into a programmer. Uh, so over the course of a few short months, they, they uh, took this business major and, and turned him into a COBOL programmer. And I spent the next seven and a half years with Anderson doing large-scale systems design, uh, programming, implementation, strategy consulting. Uh, worked at their think tank in Chicago called the Retail Place. Did original research for Best Buy and Microsoft Europe and Telecom Italia and Samsung Korea and Harley Davidson. Although the Harley Davidson guys brought some cool stuff with them uh, that we got to keep. Uh, I didn't get a leather jacket out of it though, that went to the partner. Uh, but uh, spent a lot of time uh, building, designing, building, implementing large scale software solutions. So Cisco Foods, 
you know, uh, I, I always laugh. Whenever I see a Cisco food uh, invoice label or a packing label, I design that. If I see their invoice, I design their invoice. Uh, I design the inventory allocation routines, uh, um, how they allocate who gets what product, and the substitution routines. If they don't have this product, what do they get instead? So we designed all that stuff uh, uh, behind the scenes. So back, um, uh, I uh, was working with Anderson, had made manager, um, you know, well on my way, and I, I got a phone call from a, a friend. Uh, his name is Forrest Simonton. Uh, I helped him out on some technology stuff. He had a little software company in Austin, Texas. Uh, he sold it in uh, 1996. That seems like a long time ago. But uh, he, uh, he gave me a call, and uh, my wife was pregnant with twins. And he said, how would you like to come work for him and be my director of technology? We were doing some really cool stuff in Austin. I was living in Houston. We were living in Houston at the time. And our twins were born. One of them is sitting right there, my son, J.D. Uh, he and his sister were born in Houston on January, uh, and I'm a bit of a risk taker. Not, not jumping off buildings or anything kind of stuff, but I am a risk taker. So what did I do? I left this nice, comfy, cozy job at Anderson Consulting and went with a startup company in Austin, Texas. Okay? So I commuted back and forth from Houston to Austin, uh, working at the startup, being the director of technology, which was a company called AMBAC. It was publicly traded bond insurance company, uh, and they had invested in this company in Austin to do e-procurement. Anybody know what e-procurement is? You know? e -procurement, anybody know what procurement is? That's how uh, organizations buy things. So in the state and local government level, everything has to be bid out. You, know, you have to go out for bid, you have to get quotes, you have to evaluate it, you have to encumber the funds, da 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 whole bunch of stuff goes on with that. They developed uh, the first e-procurement systems in America, or anywhere for that matter. Uh, and they brought me on as the director of technology. Um, we built out the first web-based procurement solution for state and local governments to the market. Uh, first one, uh, which is painful. I was doing training down in South Texas and I was training people that had never used a mouse before, and I'm trying to teach them how to use a web-based solution. Um, we're trying to roll out uh, a vendor pay model so that the vendors actually paid for the system and we gave away the system for free uh, to the cities, counties, and school districts. Completely different price model that ever hit the market. Enterprise software for free. Well, it can't be worth anything because you're giving it away. Well, no, we're making money on the backside, a 2% transaction fee uh, on all of that stuff. So, anyway, it was a great learning experience. Um, I decided, being a little risk taker that I was, Austin, it's great. It's the tech, you know, the tech bubble was in full gear at that point. Uh, so I decided to go off and start my own strategy consulting firm. And so a business partner, Brian Utley, and I uh, got together and uh, I had my third child on the way, uh, so she was born in February, and I started a new company that April. And so my wife looks at me like, are you nuts? You know, uh, what are we going to do for health care? What are we going to do for this? How are we going to pay the mortgage? How are we going to, you know? It's a litany of questions that any sane person would ask. Uh, and, and she was the same person in, 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 our, in our relationship. Uh, so she asked some you know, very pointed and uh, direct questions. And uh, fortunately, I was able to answer them to, uh, uh, to her satisfaction. And we started Periscope Holding uh, in 1999. Uh, we started out as a strategy consulting firm. We were writing business plans. How many of you have written a business plan? painful. It's a long, exhausting process to write a business plan for something. You have to do research on the customer market. You have to do research on the competition. You have to understand how you're going to go to market. You know, different products have different um, 
go-to-market strategies that you have to pursue. Some of them are direct sales, some of them are channel sales, some of them um, you're going to go through a, a reseller, some are going to OEM it, put their own name on it. Uh, you got to figure all that stuff out. And then on top of that, you have to come up with a financial model. I've done so many five-year financial projections. I do them in my sleep, and it actually, you know, sometimes it's like if I have to do another one, I'm going to puke. Uh, because they're, the old saying is, there are lies, damn lies, and there are financial projections. And there's nothing worse than getting raked over the coals by some analyst at a VC firm over, well, your accounts receivable in the third quarter of the fourth year, why is it that number? You're like, I don't know. We're just trying to make the assets equal the liability, and that's a great place to plug in a number. You know, I, you know, you, you look at any startup, you look at any financials for any startup company, anything beyond about 10 weeks is pure conjecture. Cash flow statements, you know, how, you know, it, it, you see the traditional hockey stick. Anyone seen the hockey stick on revenue curves? Every one of every startup, it's got a hockey stick. It's like, first year, we're not going to make much. The second year, we're going to make a little bit than the first year, but we'll make more. And then the third year, it's just going to take off and be a $100 million company. Never, ever, ever happens that way. Ever. Uh, so one of my investors uh, from Dallas, he said, it's not whether or not I believe your numbers, it's are your numbers believable? You know, so I know you're going to overestimate what your revenues are. I know you're going to underestimate what your expenses are. I know you're going to take this first round of cash and you're going to blow it. And then you're going to come around for a second round of cash. And probably a third round of cash. Because the financial projections wind up being just pure conjecture. Anyway. Um, I'll get off my soapbox about financial projections now. Um, anyway, so we wrote business plans for companies. We took them to market. We took them to the VCs and private equity firms. I think we raised for our customers, we raised somewhere in the order of about $45 million uh, for those different companies. Some of them work. Some of them flamed out spectacularly. Um, I mean, in spectacular Rockets red glare fashion, you know, uh, and it's just tremendously ugly when something like that happens. But um, uh, but some of those companies actually work. You know, when you look at the venture capital funding model, they'll say they fund 20 deals. 12 or 13 of them are going to fail. A couple of them are going to break even. A couple of those are actually going to make money. But what they're really investing for is that one out of 20 that's going to hit it out of the ballpark that you put money behind eBay, that you put money behind Facebook, that you put money behind Amazon, you know, that you really, really knock it out of the park. And that makes up for all of the losses and all the break-evens and all the heartaches. And you actually make a return on your investment that you can return back to your limited partners and your fund so that when you go out for your next round, they don't have to leave Pony up again. Uh, so we did that for a couple of years. Uh, and we incubated firms, we provided technology services to those firms, we provided advice and counsel to those firms, um, and some of them made it, some of them didn't. Uh, some of them, you know, I really wish I'd taken stock instead of cash, uh, because they turned out to be real winners, and I wound up with just my check that I'd gotten, you know, in May of 2000 for it. I really wish I'd had stock equivalent for that. Uh, but we uh, made a decision in 99-2000 uh, time frame, after we'd done this for a couple of years, that we were going to turn it into an operating company. Because one, we got sick of writing business plans. Number two, we got tired of raising money for other people and having to babysit them in incubators. Uh, so we decided uh, we'll write a business plan for ourselves. And we did. Uh, raised around the funds, went out and bought back um, AMBAC Connect, uh, which uh, they were still in business. AMBAC had pulled back away from them and they had downsized to almost nothing. So we, we went back, we bought out uh, a product called Bikespeed, which is a procurement solution in IG Commodity Code, which was uh, uh, a categorization structure for purchasing for state and local governments. We rolled up our business, we rolled up a 
uh, services are, all in Periscope Holdings. So we started doing procurement software for state and local governments, enterprise level procurement software. Um, and I was the president of the NIGP Code Services Group within that. I also did product management, I did pre-sales, I did a lot of selling, I spent a tremendous amount of time on the road uh, doing that, uh, doing sales. And enterprise software sales is a knife fight. Uh, don't let anyone kid you. Uh, we'll talk about competitors and competition in a minute. Uh, but it, it, is a, it is a stressful deal. Uh, enterprise software sales, it's a binary solution. You either win or you lose. And in state and local government, it's not only do you lose, but they're going to keep that product probably for another eight years uh, before they decide they're going to replace it. So you not only lose, you lose for a long time and you don't get to come back uh, for a while. Uh, so it's, it's high stakes. You've got investors that are breathing down your neck. Uh, they you know, may not understand that it's a 24 month sales cycle. And at the end of those 24 months, you may get nothing. Uh, and uh, that's, that's a tough conversation to have on a quarterly basis with your, with your, with your investors when you, when you miss or something gets delayed, you, know, you, get, to, you get to do that. 2012, beginning of 2012, uh, I made the decision to step back from the company. Um, number one, I was burned out. Uh, spent years and years and years on the road. Um, and I thought it was time for a break. I was going to spend 2012 studying my navel and figuring out what I wanted to do next. And about three weeks later, I'm back in the technology consulting business. And I've been doing that ever since. Uh, and so I, uh, uh, and, in, and in the middle of all of that, uh, my wife uh, was diagnosed with breast cancer, and she lost her fight this summer. Uh, but anyway, uh, so I've been doing technology consulting ever since then, uh, and helping startups. Help, I'm working with an oil and gas services company down in Houston. We have a lot of fun. I've got steel-toed boots. I've got flame retardant coveralls and a hard hat. I get to crawl around on oil rigs on a periodic basis, uh, doing fun stuff and hoping that it doesn't explode. Uh, and hoping that my technology components are not the thing that makes it explode and for me not to be on CNN because of it. So that's always you know, a, little, a little fun there uh, when you're standing there <coughs> stuff up to your knees at 2 o'clock in the morning going, okay, y'all plug it in. <laughs> I'm going to be over here. Uh, but it's a lot of fun. So. As a, as a, you know, what, so what did I do? I took the leap. And um, that, that's what entrepreneurship is about, is taking the leap. Uh, no, that is not me. Uh, <laughs> number one, uh, that's crazy. Uh, those, those guys die on a really high frequency basis. They just smack in the mountains, the ground, whatever. It looks cool, though. The video looks awesome. Uh, <laughs> I would love to do that, but uh, you'd hear me screaming all the way down. Uh, but entrepreneurship is kind of like that, you know. Left a comfortable job with Andy's consulting with twins, baby twins, bitty, bitty twins, to go with a startup company. Uh, start my own technology firm, you know, with another one on the way. Uh, all calculated risks, you know, from a business perspective. And that's the thing about risk. There's risks. You know, in Aristotle's uh, book, uh, Ethics, uh, there are, are kind of, he kind of, he didn't call them goalposts, but that's what they are. You have goalposts of, of, of behavior, you know, and courage goes from being, you know, a coward all the way to a continuum, continuum of being just completely reckless. Um, you want to find what that nice medium is in there somewhere in, in all, the, all the vectors for behaviors. Risk is one of those things. There's just wanton risk where you're just like throwing money away or taking unnecessary risk when you really don't have to versus taking calculated risk. And that's, that's what I've done. You know, I've often said I've, I've surfed with my toes gripping the edge of the surfboard uh, more than once. I've lived to tell the tale. Uh, I haven't lost my house. Uh, you know, I make a good living. And uh, you know we had a, a nice exit at Periscope, but if who who wants to be 
well, you're ending the class, but who wants to be an entrepreneur? Good, a fair good number. It's not for everybody, okay? Because when you start a business, that's what you're doing. You know, you're, you're strapping it on and you're jumping off the cliff. You know, who's heard of the ham and eggs example? Ham and eggs? Dr. Seuss. <laughs> Close. <laughs> Ham and eggs. From a from a, a, a venture capital perspective, when VC comes in next next time, ask him about ham and eggs. He'll know what it is. Uh, the chicken is involved. The pig is committed. Okay. So, <laughs> chicken's involved. Pig is committed. Okay. The entrepreneur, you're the pig. Okay. You're jumping out there. You're borrowing money, or you're getting investors. You're you know I you know. There's a company we worked with, had a beautiful product. It's called CAD.com. Great group of guys. They mortgaged their houses. They worked on it full time. They didn't work on anything else. It was great. They, what they were doing was providing an internet interface for pulling uh, advertising from the classifieds in newspapers and putting it online. Great idea. <sighs> Problem is, they were charging for it. Craig, Craigslist was free. You know, uh, it was a great idea. It was a great product. You know, it, it was it was beautiful. They lost everything. Those guys lost everything. You know, they were hands. You know, they were committed, and unfortunately, they lost on the deal. I had another entrepreneur, brilliant technologist. I mean, you know, sometimes I think I'm smart, and I think about this guy. He brilliant. Uh, he started a company, he was raising seed round, he was getting 10 grand here, 20 grand there, you know. I was like, cool, Lloyd, you're doing great, you know, your fundraising, you wrote his plan for him, you know, this is cranking right along from a fundraising perspective, and he comes in one day and he's like, John, whew, ah, I sold my Porsche. I'm like, okay, that's cool, all right, you know, I'm thinking back of my head, all right, you probably got about X amount for that, okay, we can plow that in, that means, you know, you can retain probably this much equity instead of having to give that equity up. And you're, you know, okay, good, good, good. He said, yeah, I bought a 1978 antique Mercedes G-Wagon G with it. And it needs a lot of work. And, you know, and, and at that point, I knew Lloyd was not going to make it. Because <laughs> he was chicken, not pig. He was not truly, he was more than happy to take other people's money, but he was not putting any of his into it. And as soon as his investors found out that's what he did, <coughs> Lloyd also liked to talk about his Mercedes wagon that he bought. That was he, I mean, it was a troop transport thing. I mean, it was like an army surplus from Germany. I don't know what he was thinking, but you know, he was talking about how he was having to refurbish it, and oh, he's going to have to buy this and that and the other. And the investors were, the investors were like, hmm, last check you get from me. Uh, and yeah, he wound up folding up. So, as an entrepreneur, you've got to make that decision. But you're here today, whether or not you start a business or not, you're going to wind up working for someone. At least that's why your parents sent you here. You're going to get a job somewhere, uh, hopefully. <laughs> uh, but as an employee for someone, you're almost an entrepreneur for that person that hired you, you know, to be a, to be a really effective employee. You have to treat that as your own little business. You know, whether you're doing whatever you're doing, whether you're sales or marketing or operations or whatever for that company, you know, you're your own entrepreneur and be that entrepreneur for your employer and make money for them and you know, find a way to succeed and, and, and to be happy in that. So I would like to do that though. That would be it just seems like that would be a lot of fun. It, for me, it would probably end like the LSU game. Great until like the last four or five seconds, and then it would be awful. Uh, so you want to be an entrepreneur. Uh, startup companies, are it's hard. It's hard to do startups. It's hard to come up with an idea. Who has a business idea? You're sitting in your dorm right now going, I think I've got an idea. Good. Numbers work out about right. Um, there's a saying, 
than staying in Austin. If, there's, if, if one person has an idea in Austin, there are probably 10 people in Dallas that have that same idea. And in Silicon Valley, there's probably another 50 people that are working on that idea right now. Oh, that's depressing, isn't it? Um, there are not a lot of brand new ideas out there. There really aren't. Um, most things are either uh, plugins, extensions of existing ideas, uh, some sort of meta business that relates to an existing technology, a roll up of existing provision, a better, cheaper, smarter way of doing something. Um, but as an entrepreneur, you know, the, the, the odds can be long. I, I won't kid you, I won't, I'm not going to sugarcoat it. It can be long. Um, that's just the way it is. Um, but, you know, and there's the old, you know, if, if you're one in a million, there are 1,300 of you in China, some, something like that. Um, the, uh, well, there's another stat. The uh, top 25% of people in India so with the top 25% IQ, that number is larger than the total population of the United States. Yeah. The top 10% of Chinese students, that's more than the number of students there are in America. You know, that's who you're competing with. Uh, it, it's no longer, you know, a, a localized economy. I mean, sure, you can do a localized business, but if you're going to do a global scale business, that's what you're going to be competing against. You know, enterprise software that we were in, I was in a knife fight on a daily basis with Oracle. Multi-billion dollar company, SAP. Y'all heard of SAP, right? Yeah. yeah. If not, Google it, you'll see. Uh, <laughs> knife fight with these guys every day, you know. Um, and, you know, we, we won a lot. Not always, but we won enough. Uh, enough to make it count, make it hurt, uh, make them think about it. Uh, but to be an entrepreneur, uh, it, 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 you know, you're jumping off the cliff again. Uh, but it's something that is definitely worthwhile. I uh, had somebody tell me, you're, you know, John, you've, you've owned the company for 15 years. You're pretty much worthless for working for anybody else the rest of your life. Well, yeah, probably. Uh, but uh, fortunately, things have worked out, and uh, I, I look less like an employee and more like a, a, a strategist from, from, from time to time. But, um, but it's worth it. I mean, it is absolutely worth it. I mean, if you have an idea, if you want to have a business, absolutely go for it. Um, so you've got to come up with a better mousetrap. Uh, better, cheaper, smarter, faster, something that, that uniquely puts you in a differentiated position from someone else. You know, um, you have to find somebody that's willing to pay for it. It's, uh, it's one thing to have an idea. It's another thing altogether to have somebody pay for it. If you have an idea and you're working at it and working at it and working at it and no one ever really wants to pay for it, you know what you actually call that? A hobby. A hobby. Yes. I like this guy. Very good. Uh, it's a hobby, you know. I, I had a, I, I started a, a, a company here in Mississippi a few years ago. We were doing, um, it's a long way of saying it, but uh, geo-referenced information for precision agriculture. We were looking at creating an interoperable platform for the collection and dissemination and analysis of data that comes from and is produced for precision agriculture. That's a long way of saying uh, they put all these little instruments on tractors, on plows, on planters, on sprayers, on combines. They know down to a space about this big how much moisture is there, how much phosphate it needs, how the yield is, are there any bugs on it. Great idea. Went to North Carolina, met with BASF. Oh, it's a great idea. We're going to take this to Germany. We're going to come back. Cool. Uh, met with seed companies. Met with manufacturing equipment manufacturers. Oh, that's a great idea. Great idea. Uh, US, uh, USDA. Great. You know, we can cut down on pesticide use and chemical use and 
not over irrigate when we don't need to. Da 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 da. It's all great. Who's going to pay for it? And then we got the traditional T Rex arms. Everybody's like, ooh, I'm not paying for that. You know, it's a great <coughs> idea. We really love to do it. You know, farmer can't pay for it. Manufacturers don't want to pay for it. Chemical people really don't want to pay for it because they actually want them to use more chemicals, not less chemicals. Uh, really cuts into their margins. Um, you know, so after you know several years of it, it shut it down because it became a hobby where I was flying across the country having really great meetings, but nobody wanted to pay for it. So that became a hobby, uh, which goes back to another lesson on, on entrepreneurship. If you're going to fail, fail fast. Mm -hmm. Don't spend years flying around and not getting anything out of it. As much as I like going to Charlotte, North Carolina, and other places like that, fail, fail fast. So you have to think about what's your end goal, okay? Um, there are several types of businesses that you can go into as an entrepreneur. None of them are wrong, none of them are bad. Except for being in the mafia, that would be bad. Um, <coughs> it's perfectly fine to have what you call a mom and pop business. You want to go back to your hometown, open an insurance agency, be a broker for J, you know, JD Edwards, or you know, be the local dry clean. You know, you've got mom and pop store, mom and pop businesses that will do perfectly fine. You're an entrepreneur. You're managing cash flow. You are a business owner. You know. The job growth in America is through small business. <coughs> Somebody in this, actually several of you, will go on to have some small business that will operate in your hometown or whatever town you settle in, and you're going to do just fine. And that's great. That's your goal? Great. Some of you will go to work for larger firms. And you'll go out and you'll create a company that's maybe a regional company. You know, you may be a distributor, you may be a supplier, you may be a whatever, and you operate on a, on a regional basis. My company was a national company. We had customers from the city of Fort Lauderdale to Alaska Marine Highway, from the, you know, Onondaga, New York, to uh, San Bernardino Cali County, California, state of Hawaii, et cetera, et cetera. But it's all state and local government, U.S. <coughs> based. You know, um, and that's that's the confines that you know that we were boxed into, and it was really driven by our product requirements. <coughs> uh, so we're a national company. You know, we were bought out, and we'll uh, they'll continue to be a national company. Um, or you may maybe somebody in here will create a company that will go global. I hope you do. I hope you have that idea. Uh, and one of you may. I mean. It happens every day, you know. Uh, but those are those are kind of few and far between. But know that somewhere you have to know what what your goal is, you know, at the end of the day. Okay. This also represents your competition. You know, um, I'm a competitor. I'm highly competitive. Extremely competitive. Uh, I used to, you know, because my competitors were the, you know. They had the same intentions in mind for me. But, you know, I always wanted to think that my competitor sales rep would wake up at 4.15 in the morning, lie there and look at the bed ceiling and go, okay, I can stay in the bed for another 45 minutes and i got to get up, got to go to the airport, catch a flight, make a connection, hope I'm not late, get into where I'm going, have a meeting, I'm going to make a presentation. I'm going to miss Jimmy's t-ball game. I'm going to miss Sally's dance recital tonight. We're going to make a presentation tomorrow. And, and John Walter is going to kick my head in because his product is better. His delivery model is better. His overall solution is better. It's better priced. And I'm going to lose. And I know that sitting here at 4.30 in the morning before I even leave. That's kind of cold, isn't it? <laughs> And, you know, and on top of that, I'm going to fly back home and I'm going to have to explain to my spouse why I'm not getting a bonus this quarter because John beat me in this sale. That's competition. You know, and you know, 
And my competitors are sitting there going, you know what, I hope to beat John because, you know, if I can do it long enough, he's not going to be able to make his mortgage. He's going to have to quit. That's what they're thinking about me. And that's what your competitors are going to think about you. It, it's a hard, cold world uh, when, it, when it comes to the competition. Uh, and, you know, you're in a race. You know, if you're an entrepreneur, you're in a race. You know, one of the biggest red flags I ever see in a business plan. I'll be, I'll be looking at a business plan and you get to the competition section and the worst thing, the worst opening sentence is, there is no competition for our product. If you are pursuing a space where there's money and there's a problem, I guarantee you there's going to be competition. If there's no competition, again, there are no truly new ideas. Okay, the iPhone, that, that was cool. Uh, Facebook, well, it had my, MySpace. Uh, there are really no true open, there is no Oklahoma land rush. But, yeah, that, you're not going to see that. Uh, you're going to have competitors. And so for me, when I see a business plan, they go, we don't have any competitors. I'm like, you haven't looked hard enough, have you? Or you're chasing a space where nobody cares. Uh, well, either one of those is not good. Uh, so um, just keep that, keep that in mind. And then you're going to have to deal with funders uh, as an entrepreneur. <coughs> Sorry, that, that graphic didn't turn out too hot. But uh, <laughs> if some of you may have a rich aunt or uncle who is willing to fund you for whatever you want to go do. I've got a friend like that in Austin, Texas. He's done about six businesses. None of them lasted more than about two or three years, and he just keeps going back to his family and getting more cash. God bless him. That's not me. Probably not anybody in this room has got that fortunate situation either. Uh, so you're going to have to go to funders. So... Um, the investment community, yes, they'll take you to dinner. Just remember, your funders, they're not your buddy, they're not your pal, they're not your friend. Um, if you don't perform, they will replace you. They will. And if you get venture funding, the fuse is burning as soon as you sign the closing statement. You know, you're performing or they're going to show up one day and go, you know what, John? That's a great idea you had. And you've done an awesome job as a founder taking the company as far as you could. And we're really proud of you that you were able to take the company as far as you could. We've got our friend Bill over here. He's done three of these before, and he's taken two of them public. We thought we'd bring him in and, 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 and help you out as a, as a mentor and a coach. That's a really nice way of saying Thank you, you're fired. Uh, here's some crayons. Go sit in the corner and color, all right? It happens, happens every day. Uh, and there are founders that get caught off guard by that and, and don't realize that you know, the clock is ticking. Uh, they're, not, they're not investing for fun. They're, they're investing because they want to make a return. And not a little return. If it's venture funding, they want a lot of return. And they want it in about three years or less. So. Clock's ticking. Uh, not putting pressure on you, entrepreneurs out there, but that's the way it goes. Your team. Everybody has this idealized, um, you know, as an entrepreneur, you have to build a team. And every, I love iStock Photo because they have these wonderful pictures of these teams and they're all hard working and they're diligent and they have your best interest in mind and they're not building their own product that looks just like your product on the side with their own PC late at night when you're not looking and talking to your customers and saying, you know what, I'm, I'm building a little engine over here too, you know? Uh, so, you know, we have our idealized, you know, to our, our employees and really we wind up with, you know, Cousin Eddie from Christmas Vacation, unfortunately, sometimes. Um, so as you as you build your teams, you know, my advice is hire people that are smarter than you. Don't be intimidated by hiring someone that's smarter than you. I try to hire people that are smarter than me all the time. 
because I can take that and I can give them things and I can let them run with it and they'll figure out things that I never thought of. And he put a team of them together. Uh, you pull together a diverse team of people from different walks of life and different backgrounds and you throw them in a room and they're all smart and they're all motivated. They will astound you with what they come up with. Things you never even thought of. And as a founder or as an owner of the company, you just have to roll with it because they're, they're going to come up with an idea and you're going to be going, no, 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 you can't do that. And then, then they explain it and you're like, oh yeah, you're right. That was a better idea. Good. Yeah, <laughs> now you're back to this. Yay, I've got a great team. Uh, but when you're building a team, be careful, hire smart people. Uh, but again, back to that, if you're going to fail, fail fast. Your early hires in your company are your most important things. And if you make a mistake, it's really expensive to correct that mistake later. So if you get somebody, it's not working out, you gotta have the stuff to walk in there and go, you know what, it's not working out. And you gotta go. And that's hard. It's really hard to do. It's not a pleasant conversation to have. You, know, you, you always hear the See, you know, see a grown man cry because, you know, like, yeah, I know. You poured your heart and soul into this and then working out and you got to go. Sorry, but that's what you got to do. And you got to do that. If you're going to be an entrepreneur, if you're going to run a business, sometimes you got to make those hard calls like that. Tough conversations to have. Might as well learn how to do it. Practice it in the mirror sometime. It's really hard. Partner up with a buddy sometime and, and do those. We used to do that at Anderson Consulting. We used to do mock uh, evaluations where we would do mock bad evaluations just to learn how to go. You know what, Jimmy? This isn't working out for you. Yeah, because you don't want to do that on the fly. One, you'll get sued. Number two, uh, you need to do it well. And if you can do it well, uh, but it, it, it takes practice. So don't hire that guy. So, you as an entrepreneur, what do you got to do? How am I doing on time? Ooh. All right. This is actually my last slide. So, yay. Uh, there are some things that you're going to have to do. You're going to have to learn how to develop uh, your leadership skills. Okay? You have to learn how to not to micromanage as, a, as an entrepreneur. It's really easy to micromanage. I, 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 I do it. You know? I came from a technology background, and I find myself arguing with somebody whether I should be doing an inner join or an outer join on this query to make it faster. And I have to realize, whoa, so wait a second. They're the developer. Let them develop it. You know, you got to let go. Uh, I worked with a company called Wiznet down in Florida. We raised $10 million for them. Uh, brilliant technologist, uh, a guy named uh, Safwat Fami. Uh, this is brilliant technology. Could not let go. You know, we raised money. I got tasked with, okay, we're going to ramp this company up, and we're going to, you know, we need to train salespeople. So I developed a sales script. I developed a, a model using uh, their CRM solution on how you walk through the script and, and make the sale. CEO of the company insisted that he had to train all the sales reps, personally. And he had to help also with the program. And he also insisted that he was on the infrastructure piece to make sure all the hardware was correct. And he also wanted to do all the investor relations because he was the only one that really understood the business. So he was the only one that could do the investor calls. See a problem there? It's called founder syndrome. Can't let it go. Ask the VC. Just ask him. You heard about founder syndrome? They'll go, oh yeah. That's how founders get shot really fast, uh, this founder syndrome. We brought in an advertising company, this man named Andy Lark with Fleischman Hillard, global advertising PR firm. Mr. Fahmy said, I want to be on the front page of the Wall Street Journal. Period. I do. Andy said, I can get you on the front page of the Wall Street Journal. It'll take me six months, but I'll get you on the front page of the Wall Street Journal. And then he countered and said, you're not ready to be on the front page of the Wall Street Journal by any stretch of the imagination. 
as my as your advertising person, this is a bad move. He insisted. Founder syndrome. He knew best. He wanted to be on the front page of Wall Street Journal. Five months later, Andy was good. Five months later, he was on the front page of the Wall Street Journal with his little because he wanted his little dot. You know how they have the little dot uh, portraits of people. He really wanted his dot portrait on the front page of the Wall Street Journal. He did. He received, I think, 25,000 requests for information <coughs> off of that. Guess what? He had not trained any of the sales reps because he hadn't gotten around to it. Matter of fact, he hadn't hired any sales reps. He had two sales reps and somewhere on the order of 25,000 to 30,000 leads to follow up on. Imploded in a spectacular fashion. I told you, rocket's red glare implosion. Rocket's red glare implosion of a company. It folded up, you know, in, in about, uh, it took about another six months, but uh, the investors basically said, yep, you're an idiot. Uh, you're gonna go out. Well, he had written his own employment contract that said he had a $3 million buyout for any cause. Well, can't do that. Now they shut the doors. So don't be that guy. Uh, but you as an entrepreneur, you have to develop your leadership skills so that when you say you're going this way, okay, the team will go that way. But you've given them the authority and the responsibility and the tools and the training to be able to carry the company in that direction. That's your job <coughs> as the entrepreneur. That's your job as the CEO. It's your job as the leader of the organization is to do that. Okay. So, you want to be an entrepreneur. Good luck with it. Not good luck in a sarcastic way. <laughs> Genuine, genuinely, good luck. Uh, it does take a lot of luck. I've found over, the, over time Luck plays a lot into it. You know, luck is, the more I prepare, the luckier I get. So, while you're here at Mississippi State, get the training, get the tools, make the connections, get involved with the network so that you can make those phone calls or make the connections later. You know, because it does take a network of people for a company to succeed. It really, really does. You can build those networks. That's, that's, that's what your four years here in college are all about, making those networks. I was walking around on campus on, on Saturday at the tailgate, and I was like, and I'm not paid. There, but, you know, after, you know, people would just stop by, hey, John, how you doing? You know, and it's just, you know, this network of people that I've built over these years. You know, last funny story, I was at a trade show one time, and because I flew so much, I got bumped up to first class, and everybody at the trade show was on that flight from San Francisco to Dallas. And I'm sitting in first class, having a beverage. The fellow's sitting next to me. And it's just a stream of people walking by. John, John, hey, hey. After about, I don't know, 30 people walked by, guy turns to me and he said, you know, should I be getting your autograph from my daughter or something? Because way too many people know you. Um, but no, it's the networks that you build. And those are the networks that you'll use on a go-forward basis and it'll help you succeed. All right. We're about out of time. I think uh, we were going to open it up for... <coughs> yes, that was my last slide. So. Awesome. Yeah, they, they've been sending in questions. Uh, first one, uh, a number of students have phrased it a different way, but they're asking about engineering for business. What mm -hmm. did you like about engineering? Was it your co-op? Was it your coursework? Talk a little bit more about this. Oh, okay. Um, yes, I, uh, you know, I, um, I, I knew in the core of my being I wanted to be an aerospace engineer. Um, I, I came to some state, did two years. I did the co-op program. The co-op program is awesome, by the way. If you if you get a chance, do it. It's awesome. Went to Lockheed. I got to see the coolest stuff on the planet. I was in a department called Aircraft Combat Survivability. It was neat. We were figuring out how to shoot down airplanes. It was, it was awesome. Uh, and part of that department was a uh, nuclear, biological, chemical warfare group. And at that point, this shows you how old I am, uh, the Iran-Iraq war was going on at that point. And we were getting coloids 
Polaroids from the battlefront on Mondays that were taken on Friday, flown overnight, and dropped into the apartment. Had a big secret stamp on them. Because we were watching, oh, gee, that's mustard gas. Oh, that's chlorine. Yeah. Gee, that looks really bad. Uh, anyway, worked at Lockheed, had a great time doing it. Um, uh, it, but but as I did it, I, just, I you know I, I kind of came to the realization that I didn't want uh, I, I kind of wanted to be a pilot. Uh, they took me into this place called the War Lab and showed me how there's a 95 percent chance if we went to war with Russia in Germany, I'd probably get shot down. Uh, that was a little disconcerting. Um, but uh, over time, as I as I worked there, I didn't love it. You know, it was cool. It was really cool crawling around on airplanes and looking at fragments and doing all this stuff. It was really cool, but I didn't love it. You know, if you don't do something that you love, you're going to have a career of being miserable. Uh, so I didn't love it. I didn't love, uh, didn't love it. Uh, I had a mind for business, um, and so I made the switch. Uh, you know, you have to figure out what you love and what you don't love. And, and don't, go, don't go chasing something you don't love. Even though it may be really cool, but if you don't love it, don't do it. Uh, Stephen Fuller asked, "What made you take the leap of faith going with the startup rather than staying with the already established company?" That's a great question. Where's, um, that is a great question. Uh, and you know, um, being with an I mean, it was a global company, established company, I was on a nice track, on a nice trajectory, to make partner um, with Anderson, um, but um, the idea of going with a startup company and creating something new and something fresh and being able to say that's my product, uh, that's my company, uh, really appealed to me. You know, when you're in a company of 100 and 50, 180,000 people. You know how hard it is to actually change something? Uh, talking about, you know, large organizations or aircraft carriers that take a long time to turn. This one's like multiple aircraft carriers tied together, you know, trying to trying to pivot. Uh, so I saw the chat. Where, where's the question and answer faster anyway? So. Where's Steven? Do you follow where you at? Ah, there you go. Um, but anyway, to, to answer the question, though, um, to me, it was, it, was, it was the challenge of going and building something new for myself that really sparked my interest. Uh, it would have been perfectly safe if I, actually, if I would stayed with uh, Anderson Consulting for another year and a half, two years, it turned into Accenture, and it wound up being a publicly traded company, and I would have, you know, I would have done very well with, with that. Uh, but it wouldn't have been my deal, so I kind of wanted to do my thing. Good question. Follow-up question from Hagen Walker. Uh, with, that, with hindsight, was it worth it? Absolutely. Absolutely it was worth it. Um, was it easy? No. Did I spend way too much time on the road? Yes. I missed family vacations. I missed a lot of stuff, uh, you know, from a regret standpoint, yeah, I missed some things, but, you know, as my favorite movie is The Godfather, uh, Vito Corleone said, well, that's the life I've chosen. You know, uh, actually hit that one. Uh, but, um, but was it all, was it all worth it? Yes, absolutely. It put me in a position, you know, you, you kind of, you know, say there are you know, God things that happen, not the possible thing, but, you know, being in the position that I was in when my wife was ill, uh, you know, if I had had a normal nine to five job working, stuff, you know, that wouldn't have worked. You know, I don't know what I would have done if I hadn't have been in that position and been able to do what I was able to do, you know, during that three year fight. Uh, but, uh, but in hindsight, though, was it worth it? Absolutely. Not easy. A lot of sleepless nights, a lot of time on the road. I was sitting in the airports watching CNN for the 4,000th time, talking about something stupid. Yeah, but it was worth it. Uh, 
good transition to this question from Willie Green asking, did you have any trouble with work-life balance and how did you manage it? Work-life balance, yeah, that's a tricky one. Uh, when you're the when you're the entrepreneur, there really is no work-life balance. You know, you work 24 hours a day, you think about it 24 hours a day. Um, uh, you have to be cognizant, though, that the people that work for you have a life. Um, you know, you know. Yes, they may be chickens. You're the ham. You're the you're the pig. They're the chicken. Uh, but you do have to find time to take care of yourself, though. You do have to take breaks. You do have to step back from it. Otherwise, you you will be a crispy critter in fairly short order because there's always something to be done. If it's a if it's a startup, there's always something to be done. You know, you see these startups and you're like, oh, they're working till three o'clock in the morning every morning. And it's because there's you know there's code to be written. There's there's five thousand different things that need to be done, and they all need to be done tomorrow. The answer really is, yeah, not all of them have to be done tomorrow. In, in actuality, but you seem to uh, lean forward on that and. But you do have to you do have to take a step back. You do have to take care of yourself and your family. Though. Uh, Anya asks, how have you learned to cope with stress that comes with these high risk situations? <coughs> That's a good one. Where where is? Ah. Um, stress management is 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 key. Uh, I run a lot. Uh, for my, my outlet for the better part of a decade, I ran marathons. I, I'm a certified marathon coach. I coached people in marathons uh, on Saturdays. I uh, did that for almost a decade. So I run, I exercise. Uh, uh, that's one, one thing. Uh, number two, you really have to prioritize things. Um, I had a manager at Anderson one time that gave me a great say said, if whatever you're worried about, if it's not going to matter in five years, it's probably not that important. When you think about it, there are not a lot of decisions that rise to that level of is this really going to matter in five years. Your family, of course, that matters. Uh, there are some big business decisions that you have to make, and those will be stressful. But everything else is pretty much small stuff. You know, uh, If that report doesn't get done tomorrow, Probably okay. Uh, you know, if you handle the expectations and the messaging around why you didn't get it done tomorrow, it's fine. Not that you guys can turn your homework in late. I'm not saying that. <laughs> but uh, you, you do have to find your own mechanism to help. Otherwise, it will eat you. Great. This question comes from uh, Matt Waddle. What type of training did you do to prepare for the knife fights you were involved in? Ooh, nice. Um, um, I did do the Dale Carnegie uh, court, this 10 week uh, Dale, Car uh, what's it called? It's the Dale Carnegie course. Did that. Um, that helped me from a public speaking perspective. I'm breaking all kinds of rules in the way I did this presentation. I know. But um, I move around too much, I wave my arms and hands too much. Fine. Um, but that. Um, I did get some formal training at Anderson related to the sales process, and some of it was trial and error, you know. Get your head kicked in on a proposal because you didn't follow the format correctly. Well, next time we're following all the formats correctly, even down to <coughs> time drum and 12 font, you know, et cetera. Uh, part of it's trial and error. Part of it, I mean, I did a ton of reading. Um, related to the sales process. And then I found some good mentors uh, that were in enterprise software sales. You know, spent time with them on, okay, how do you, sales really is just this giant funnel. We would say you throw cows in the top and sausage comes out the bottom. So how do you manage the lead generation process? How do you manage the inside sales, outside sales, and winnow it down to, you know, qualified leads and you know, and get it, you know, there, there, there is a process to that, there is a method to that madness, uh, and that information is out there, but a mentor is great there. Uh, 
Uh, interesting question from Michael Solon. Where's Michael? Uh, what would you say is the best way to turn a business or a hobby into a business? Um, well, part of it is, you know, again, is, you know, uh, uh, business somebody will pay for it. Um, the, the hobby, you know, if, if you have a hobby, um, <coughs> the first part is, you know, trying to figure out is there a mark, does your hobby have a a product, or is it, you know, my hobby is running. I'm really not fast enough to get paid for it, really, really not, uh, so I'm not going to get any endorsement money. Uh, but if your hobby produces a product or an end product, is there a market for it? Are there people that are buying similar products or services? Uh, if, if there's not, then there's probably a pretty good chance that it will remain a hobby and something that will make you very happy and it'll be your nice stress reliever and you know, uh, along those lines. But if it if it produces something though that people are buying something similar to it, then you may have a fair chance of, of turning it into a business. Uh, Tanner asks, were there any common red flags with the businesses you were writing plans for, other than the competition that Greg mentioned? Ah, where's Tanner? Tanner. Ah, there you go. Um, good question. Uh, there are common red flags that I would see. Um, there, there, there are usually a couple of things. Um, one, uh, the, the being supremely overly optimistic about the revenue curve. You know, that I'm going to take it from a business that has no customers and no revenue. End of the year, I'm going to have realistically okay, 25 customers, because I think of some people that in the third year, though, I'm going to have 10,000 customers, and we're going to be doing $50 million of revenue. And then on the flip side of that, you look at the expense side of their chart, and they're like, okay, where are the people that are going to sell that? Where are the people that are going to manage that? Where is the operations team? Where is your accounting department? Where is your support staff? I mean, developers are going to take to build all this stuff, and they still have a head count of four. Okay, you're going to, okay, you're going to be the m most wildly profitable company on the planet with four people. No, you're not. Okay, so back to do I believe your numbers or are your numbers believable? Is it sustainable? Is it scalable? You know, I see a lot of people will say, you know, I can really do this with a part -time, one part-time programmer and I'll take the phone calls and I'll do the sales and, you know, my, my brother-in-law, Jimmy, he's really good at QuickBooks. He'll handle all the billing. For nothing, you know. No, uh, that, that's probably the biggest red flag I'll see in there. Is you'll see the you know, revenue go off the charts and the head count sitting there, you know, flat. That is that work. That's probably the biggest one. Uh, the other one is competition. Um, and then the third third area I'll see is uh, just uh, a, a not really understanding the market. You know, who are you going to sell it to? You know. Or the business plan. Have you guys ever seen this thing? Uh, it's uh, the uh, arch enemy. You know the you know the bad guy in the movie. There's just like this whole thing of the mistakes that the bad guys in the movies always make. You know, yes, Mr. Bond, I'm going to kill you. And you know, you're tied to a table with a you know a laser beam, and gonna I'm going to walk out over here, and I'm just going to assume that my minions are going to kill you, and you know. It'll be good instead of shooting things fun. Mm -hmm. uh, you'll see business plans that have like five ifs. You know, if we can do this, and if this, and if the market does this, and if we provide a product that does this, and if there's a full moon next Thursday, we'll go from zero sales to 100 million. You know. And the story just doesn't hang together. You know, uh, there's too many things that could go wrong. You know, too many things that you're predicating your success on. You'll see that sometimes in business plans, and you're just like, oh, you're Dr. Evil, you know, you're going to, okay. magically, it's going to happen. There's no magic. And I'll make this the last question. Okay. Did you want to create a startup company while you were in undergraduate? Have any ambitions? Yes, I did. I was an idea a minute in undergrad. I, I had ideas coming out of my ears. None of them happen. 
<laughs> uh, I, yeah, it was. Uh, you know, I, I, I wish I'd. I wish I had actually had a journal and written all this stuff down. By the way, get a journal. Keep track of what you do while you're here. It makes a great read. You know, later. Uh, but yeah, that was an idea. I mean, it was just my notebooks had eh, business. Blah, blah, blah. Yeah. And uh, none of them ever happened. But yes, I did have tons and tons of business ideas. Um, uh, none of which came to fruition. Um, well, John, if you had had the benefit of the MSU entrepreneurship program? Yes, because then I could, you know, the great thing about the entrepreneurship program here is that you can, you can take the idea, you can go to the entrepreneurship, so you've got an entrepreneurship network. You know, you, you know we didn't have an elevator pitch night. Um, I didn't even know what an elevator pitch was then, you know. Uh, we didn't have that. You've got a very safe environment here to meet people, bounce ideas off of them, get in front of a white, I'm a whiteboard junkie, get in front of a whiteboard, sketch it out, try to figure out, is this viable? Is, there, is this a product? Is there a market for it? You know, you've got the Maroon X, uh, which is awesome. I went to the one at A&M. It's out there going, this is great. Because, you know, here are these, you know, kids, you guys, uh, that are building these businesses and they spent the summer trying to validate, is there actually a market for what we're trying to do? One of them, that was a great idea, and, you know, and they spent the whole summer and they're like, nope, we couldn't, we couldn't find a market. <laughs> I'm like, well, but at least you found out now. Uh, so, Entrepreneurship Center, take advantage of it. Uh, it's a great, great resource. I really wish we had had it when I was here. Thank you all very, very much. I do John. All right, guys, uh, that's it for today. See you next week. We'll have uh, Dr. Henry Jones here to join us. Thank you.